Ladies and gentlemen, chess is a game that makes us feel all sorts of complex emotions. And if you followed my channel for a while, if you followed my channel recently, if you've never seen me before, and you've just clicked on this video because the YouTube algorithm recommended it to you, well, you should know that I wear my emotions on my sleeve in chess, and I show them to all of you. And in this video, we will once again be taking a look at a recent chess tournament that I played in. I am retired in the traditional sense. I do not play physical over-the-board chess because it causes me a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety, but I do play online. And I played another event in chess.com's Title Tuesday Tournament, which is an event where you play 11 games against titled chess players. And yesterday, I performed like a grandmaster. I had my best result in years, scoring eight out of 11. Eight wins, three losses, tying my record. I have never scored eight and a half. And I basically tied for like eighth place in a tournament with some of the best grandmasters in the world. Uh, I did not have a chance to play against Magnus Carlsen, but he won the event. So that was very special. And I'm gonna show you three games that I played against some of the best grandmasters uh, in Rapid and Blitz events online. And just show you that I actually can be a good chess player. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Also, if you're watching this in late 2023, I'm going on a mini, mini world tour. I will be in New York and New Jersey. Uh, these events are coming up. I will be in London. I will be in Florida. And I'm going to be in Toronto. So link is in the description if you want to do a little meet and greet, get a signed copy of my book, go to an event. We'll take a photo together as well. Uh, very excited to meet you all. And maybe there will be more events coming in 2024. So, E4. In this game, I played against somebody named GM Peter, and when I saw that this person was a grandmaster but rated 2400 blitz, I, I assumed they were old. That is probably, you know, I, that's probably not a good thing that I assume that, but I just assume, but actually it turns out it's a 19 year old grandmaster from India. 19 and 2400, this dude should be like 2700. And this dude had won a couple of nice games, so. He played e5, and I went for my, my true and tried Vienna, uh, which is what I play against e4, e5. Highly recommend the Vienna opening, Vienna Gambit, for those of you that don't know it. Uh, my opponent did not play bishop c5, which is the copycat, which allows queen g4, with some good attacking possibilities on this pawn. The most famous line being this one, where you move your king. That's not mate, but you create very annoying threats to your opponent. Uh, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. People at my level, they generally play the two knights, and then he played bishop to b4. And you'll notice I have not spent any time in the opening. Literally no time at all, because I know the opening. And uh, you get a second bonus in Title Tuesday. Now at this point, many people take this knight. Uh, they take this knight even as early as this position. Uh, they try to play for a very quick pawn to d5 as well. Uh, but my opponent did not play for pawn to d5. Played d6 which allows me to play this move. And now, in, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what's called put pressure on the pinned piece. So if my opponent plays something like rook e8, this would be a very big mistake, look. Because whenever there's a pin on a knight to a queen, and you can apply more pressure, and nothing can get in the way, this is a big problem. Because the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to bring even more pieces. But in general, what you want is to open up the king. And you want to play knight g3, queen h5, knight, you know, all of this good attacking stuff. So... What did my opponent do? My opponent tried to kick me out, and I took and went here. Okay, and, I, and I, I had a plan here. I'm getting out of the way of this bishop, so now I'm gonna force the queen back and expand all of my pawns. Expand that entire armada of pawns forward. Why? Because I'm threatening to trap the bishop, which now has no moves, and the only way to stop that is to play a5. And so here, I'm now going to take and damage my opponent's pawn structure. It is much better for my opponent to take with the A pawn to keep this all together, right? All the pawns together and open up the rook. It is much worse for my opponent to have to do this. That is very ugly. Now there is no C pawn, so there's no anchor to these pawns. And these squares are very exploitable. These pawns will be weaknesses forever. And I thought, you know what? I, I got exactly what I wanted from the opening. I mean, in chess, the opening is supposed to get you to a position where you are more comfortable than your opponents where you are uh, understanding the plans better, where you have an advantage. I have a one minute and 10 second time advantage from the opening, uh, and uh, well, I would like to think I'm better. Now, my advantage immediately goes away after I play this move, apparently. 
I was debating for a long time whether I wanted to push, but I did not see a clear way forward here. The computer does want me to push and then play queen b3, stop d5, stop bishop to e6, uh, and, you know, my opponent would do something like this and fight back. Uh, but I, I, didn't, I didn't like that, so I kept the tension. But after this, I thought, well, I'm very happy. I mean, these pawns are awful, right? These pawns are bad. I'm going to expand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide forward with my queen in the future, put some good pressure on these pawns. Opponent went here, and so now it's another very instructive moment. Uh, white is better, but only if white plays a certain plan, and that plan is this f4 move. Immediately activating the rook. And if my opponent doesn't take me, well, if they do take me, I'm going to go here and here, or there. Now, if they don't take me, I'm going to play f5. I'm going to shut down this bishop. So if bishop d7 is played, I'm going to play f5. And now, now black's pieces just can't get into the game at all. At all. And the more you trade, the more damage you are doing. Doubled, two sets of doubled and isolated pawns. This is a terrible position for black. Terrible. With a capital T. So, bishop to e6, f5. Bishop takes, queen takes, and I thought, well, I'm just very happy. I mean, I've tr done everything that I wanted. Now, the computer is completely unimpressed. <laughs> as you can see, it says minus 0.04, which just means equal, and if anybody's better, it's black. But my opponent was playing very slowly. He was playing so slowly. I had 230, he had 51 seconds on the clock, and here he tried to fight back against me, and uh, I, I, I thought I came up with a very neat idea, which was to just completely neutralize him and do this. Look at my queen. Defending everybody. You know, I'm going to go f6 next. So if my opponent plays something like rook c2, I'm going to play f6. I'm going to open up the king. And I thought I got good attacking chances. Again, computer, not impressed. Not afraid at all. So maybe that wasn't necessarily the right idea. But maybe e6 to create a pass pawn. Very, very combative game. And now the pawns start falling. So I, I, I get b6. My opponent now should definitely take this. But he goes here. And then I get that pawn. My opponent goes to the second rank. And I, and I just start defending myself. I start trying to trade the pieces because I'm looking to get into a winning endgame. I'm trying to get into a winning queen endgame. And then I make a mistake. I make a mistake and I actually, I get very upset with myself right here. I play h3 and I blunder the fact that after rook takes, regardless of how I take back, I'm going to lose a pawn. So if rook f2, queen f2, this check and I lose that pawn. So rather than getting frustrated, and then if king f2, there is this. But rather than getting frustrated with myself here, I actually managed to regain my composure and find a really nice idea. Also, my opponent has 10 seconds, right? So I found a very nice idea, which was this, this, this. And the point is you cannot take this pawn. Because I realized that I have check here and a winning king and pawn endgame this is such a deep idea which i saw in like five seconds I, I went full magnus carlson here the point is yes material is equal and like let's say king g6 but the point is black has no moves if black takes me my king gets out and active and i'm disallowing this king to get close my king will then go to that pawn and i will win the game if my opponent does not take my queen and instead plays h5, I will just wait. And at some point, black will run out of moves. If f6, I go here and black just can't do anything. We're stuck. And at some point, black will need to do this. My king will go and I will promote. So I realized when I, when I went here, my opponent can take, but I'm going to be with. And I, oh, my, I just made my entire objective. Run forward. Run forward, sack the pawns, and just go forward. Make this really difficult. The opponent only has five seconds. He started giving me desperate checks, but he accidentally forced my king to a winning situation. So now I have two pass pawns, and there is not a single check. So my opponent panicked in this, in this queen end game. I ran my king, I regained my composure, and I managed to actually win this game. He tried to trick me with low time and... And I won. That was a nice, you know, that was a nice win. It was very combative. It was very back and forth. And it really built my confidence. Uh, and, and I managed to beat two 2900 level GMs after that. So, you know, not every day. Vladislav Kovalev. Uh, Kovalev, he's a, uh, a grandmaster from Belarus. Very strong player, like 2670, I think was his peak. Uh, and by the way, another Vienna. Just like the last game. This time, Bishop C5. You will remember that in this game... In the opening, my opponent won bishop before. You, you got to know your openings. And by the way, if you want to learn more about the Vienna, e4 course. Holler at your boy. f4. 
d6, knight a4, this tricky line where you try to get this bishop. Opponent played here, I took the bishop. And now here, white can castle, white can play c3, white can also take on e5. I decided to castle and just be a little bit solid. Uh, I was not afraid of this because of rook f2 or rook e1. My opponent also castled and I was like, wait a minute, but what about the pawn? And I thought, how exactly is he going to get the pawn back? Now he started attacking me and I just stayed solid and he just tried to get my pawn back. That was the entire game. And so here was a big moment. What I probably should have done is I should have stayed, I, I should have went for the knight directly because then I would have had this, 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 and then here I could play rook f2. And then if he takes my pawn, I could maybe play d4, or I could play take, take, and d4, or f4. This looks quite nice. And then I can push him back, and then I can play f5 and try to trap his bishop. Look at him. His bishop is locked in a cage. Right? If he plays something like rook d8, I'll play bishop c2, or queen h5, right? And so this is probably what I should have done, but I, I did it this way, and, and the problem with doing it that way is his knight is going to survive. So now I, I spent a lot of time here, and I played a, a move that is not the best move. The position is still equal. Take, take, and I said, you know what? I gotta get rid of that knight, boom, boom. And I thought, okay, I'm in an equal endgame against the 2900 GM, right? We have uh, six pawns each, um, seven pawns, I can't count. Seven pawns each, queens and rooks. He went here, I unpinned myself. I could have taken on a7, but then he would have played something like c4. Okay, b4, uh, and, then, uh, and then f4, right? So pushing him out, and then, you know, maybe gonna win this, or take this, or take on a7, and take on c7, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna just gonna draw the game, because, you know, playing a GM, not a bad result, queen d6, took on a7, he took on c3, I took on c3, he took on d3, I took on d3, he took on d3, takes, takes, okay, two rooks, four pawns, two rooks, four pawns, we are going to trade off these pawns, and I thought, I am slightly better here because I have a more active rook. And then he just very quickly went here. And my friends, these are typically positions that I lose to grandmasters. I mean, I, I just panic, I do something stupid, I find a way to lose this, I'm, you know, and, and I thought, you know, why am I, why, 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 King G2? What I don't wanna do here is I don't want to end up in a weird situation, this blunder's checkmate, by the way, but let's just say he has a pawn on h6 first. Let's just, you know, h6. You know, uh, you know, rookie one, something like that. You don't want to get like slammed here, you know, with your king stuck. So I thought, let me bring my king up. Because anytime he's going to take this pawn, I'm going to take this pawn, right? So he played g6, and I offered a trade. And my idea was take, take, check, here, here, rook c5. He's going to go for this pawn, and I'll play like h3, and he'll, you know, rook c, whatever. And I'll be fine. And then... He went here, and I got a little spooked, but then I found f5, which I thought was a nice idea, ready to run my king out of the danger of the rooks. And then here's something insane happened. He gave me a check, and I thought, okay, well, he could take, or he could take, or he could go here. And he played rook e2. And rook e2 sets up g5 mate, which is a very scary move against the grandmaster, you know? Oh my god, the grandmaster is trying to checkmate me, whoa! And I thought, well, I can play f6, and then g5, f4, oh, look at me, I'm very strong, you know? And, and, and I also was thinking e6, and I was thinking rook g3, and I was thinking all these things, and then I went... Wait. Always look for checks. Mate in three. This was not here during the game. And I thought, oh my god, check... Check, mate. I didn't even, look at how much time it took me to find checkmate. Nine seconds. I was sitting there looking at the board going, wait, what about g5 mate? Like, what do I do? The, he blundered mate. He just straight up blundered a checkmate in a rook end game. And that's what happens when your pawns get so advanced. Sometimes it just happens. You know, and, and again, okay, yes, was this lucky? Yes, unquestionably, but I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that, you know, you earn your luck in chess, all right? You, you earn your luck, and uh, in this game, it was combative, and it was probably supposed to be a draw, but sometimes that's what happens. Normally, I am on the receiving end of such a checkmate, and then I want to cry, but the most impressive game that I played of the tournament by far uh, was this game against Sergei Zhigalko. I, I beat Zhigalko once before. He's always playing against Hikaru. He's played Hikaru many times. Um... I have a record of four and eight against him. I've won four games, I've lost eight games, which I will take because he's a very good player. And this is probably the best game that I've played in the last month. So I played E4. Now admittedly, uh, if he actually is in Belarus, he probably played this game at two in the morning. But aside from that, he's a great player. I'm very happy to win this game. 
C5, and I played A3. I play a lot of different things. A3 is also actually in the E4 course. The idea of this was not to promote the E4 course, but, you know, I like to play the A3 Sicilian. I like to play this wing gambit style. And he played a D5. He spent 25 seconds on that move. Maybe he was fixing his wires or he was fixing, you know. Played D5, which is a very decent move. And then he played Knight F6, which I haven't seen in a long time. I mean, most people take with the queen. And so I thought, okay, let's just be simple. Let's not be greedy. Let's not try to hang on to the pawn because he's probably going to win it back. And if he doesn't win it back, he's going to, you know, play in a gambit way and put his knight here. And I'm not better despite being... So, you know, I thought, knight, fine. Get your pawn back, buddy. D4. I'm playing D4 because after takes, maybe I'll take with the queen. Then I'll play bishop B5. Then I'll castle. Maybe I'll take with the knight. And I just thought, I like this position. I'm going to go here and castle. And this move... It doesn't hurt or benefit my position. If anything, you could argue it benefits more than hurts because I will expand my pawns, right? So my pawns will then work together and my second move, A3, isn't so stupid after all. So from the early opening, you know, he was developing his pieces and he was actually playing in a very aggressive way. He was trying to get me to take his pawn. Um, probably against a lower rated player I would take, but I have a lot of respect for like 2,900 GMs, which I shouldn't. And I just decided I'm going to keep it simple. I'm not going to go take that pawn. He wants me to take the pawn, and then he wants to, like, try to win the pawn back, and then he wants me to play b4 and get all... You know, and I'm just like, do, do I trust myself to, to keep this? I don't know. Let's just do this. And he played e6. Now I can't take the pawn for free. And then I played c4. And I had a very simple plan here. My simple plan was going to be to take this pawn, offering a trade of queens, which I thought benefited me because I would get the file, and then I would expand my pawns. And I'm going to expand my pawns no matter what because I need to justify my second move, right? So the way the pawn structure is changing in this middle game, I was like, I'm going to expand my queen side pawn. So I played b4. He didn't trade with me, and I didn't trade with him. Our queens are having a staring contest. I don't want to take him because I don't want his rook there, and he doesn't want to take me because he doesn't want my rook there, and he probably also wants to keep his queen because he wants to win the game. When you're trying to play for a win, you're not trying to go to an end game, which is probably just going to be equal. So he played castles. Uh, and I just finished my development. At some point, I'm playing h3. I'm thinking, where are my pieces going to go? And then after that, where are my pawns going to go? Do I want to play b5? Do I want to play c5? Do I want to not touch the pawns? Because they control four very important squares. Right? I have a little bit more space. So he goes here. And this was probably my best moment of the game. Because what does black want? Black wants to play rook c8, rook d8. Or black wants to play rook d8. And then maybe double. And if I play a lazy move... He's going to play rook d8, I'm going to have to move my queen, and then he's going to play a5, rook c8, he's going to start firing away at my structure here. So I thought, I thought, how do I disrupt Zhigalko's development? I spent most of my time advantage and played knight b5. I thought this was a very clever move, because his options now are to go back here, which walks directly into my rooks, which is a problem, or he has to go to the corner. And that's a big loss of time. And he can't come forward because if he comes forward, he walks directly into c5, which is a big, big, big mistake. Because now he has to go here, and his position has not improved. If anything, he's allowed in my knight way closer than it should be. He can't really go back to stop me because I'm just going to keep going. I'm just going to keep going. He's got to go back all the way to b8. Now, this is very unpleasant. This should be five. Like, a, no, you don't. Queen d4 is a nice little fork. Um, so he went queen b8, and then I thought, boom. And so now I'm going to put my rooks here and I'm going to bring my knight to d4, and I'm going to play h3. This is my plan. So I was very cerebral this game. I was playing much better than I normally do against 2900s. a6, I brought my knight back to d4, and I took like this. He won queen c7, and I thought, okay, I want this, 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 just to, just to kick out the bishop and also give a little luff for my king, and then I probably want to put my queen on one of these two squares. Either b2 to have pressure, or e3 to fight for the center and also threaten stuff with my bishop, right? Create a battery and then do that. And I'm still not touching these pawns because they don't, they don't have to be touched. They're in, a, they're in a pretty good, comfortable position, okay? So I played queen e3 now. And at the same time, I need to monitor my clock, which I'm doing a good job of. I, I'm slightly better for this game. I haven't given him a chance to create any, any counterplay yet, any meaningful counterplay. And I'm stopping him from doing his plan. If rook c8, I'm probably going to play rook c1, but he can't do this because this. I'm just going to win material. So he can't do that. So what does he do? He undevelops his knight to control b6. I'm making things difficult for him. I bring one of my rooks. He brings his rook. And then I finish my setup, right? 
I get to that setup that I wanted. I have a 0.4 advantage and a 20 second lead on the clock. But this is the part of the game where I always panic. This is the part of the game against the Grandmasters where I always screw something up. I have this beautiful thing and I need to put a final couple touches on it. And then I screw everything up and they get counterplay and then I tank all my clock time and then I do something desperate. In fact, I did it immediately. I did it right away. The best thing in this position, the side that has more space in chess wants to avoid exchanges. Why? Because if you decide to trade all your pieces, look, look, look. If you trade all your pieces, rook d8, take, take. Yes, in this particular instance, there is bishop 2 f3 and then some endgame stuff. But let's just say this is the position. There's no advantage. It's gone. In, this is a very rare case. White can attack. But my, my point is, white needs more pieces on the board than not. White needs to go here and then take with the bishop. And then here, or threaten mate, or expand the pawns. What you, or, or you need to play c5, take space away, build your brick wall. But I'm playing a 2900, so I, I go here. And, and my logic was, well, he, this is his most active piece. Now he doesn't have any active pieces. Look, advantage is gone. The good thing is, despite the advantage being gone, the position is still very solid. Still white is doing very well, right? But I don't need to respect his position. I need to call the shots. And against any 2700, 2600, I would play knight to e5. I would say, take, take, you can't go queen c6 because I'm gonna go bishop f3. You know, then I have to think about some other stuff, but th this is what I would be doing. Instead, I play bishop d3, but, but at least, at least he has no targets. And then here I, I, I play rook d1. And I, I thought this was a very nice idea. And my idea here was that I'm giving him the, again, no need for that. I should just play c5. And frankly, I should have played c5 two moves ago. But the idea was, if he takes me, I'm going to go here, which I thought was a position ruiner. I thought, take, rook d7, rook d7, rook d7, look at this. If queen c1, I can take, and then take, and then king h2. And the computer finds a brilliant defensive move, which is this. Ooh, not that, which is this. <laughs> he can sacrifice the rook for defensive measures and bishop d6 check. I did not see that, uh, neither did he. I thought this was very clever, as it turns out the stockfish is a scumbag, but I, he didn't see it. And all of a sudden, the sky started to illuminate. He set a trap. This looks like it works. It doesn't because he has rook d3. And if I take his queen, he can get that. Or that would check and then my bishop. So that doesn't work. But I realized, wait a minute. What if I just play knight e5? And now I have one very powerful idea. And I'm up 25 seconds on the clock. At this point, I'm like, am I going to win this game? He goes back to b8. And I went rookie one. And I set something up, which he fell directly into. I am setting up the fact that all his pieces are standing around but nobody is protecting the king. The king is protecting the house on his own. And I have a cannon pointed that way, and I'm stable. Everything is stable. And he played b5 with three seconds on the clock, and I hit him with knight takes f7. And the point is, everything falls apart. In the words of Lincoln Park, even the people who never frown eventually break down. The sacrifice. Great song, by the way. Shout out to Lincoln Park, R.I.P. Chester. Queen e6, knight h6, all ideas. And if you don't take me, I don't really know what's going to happen because I'll probably take your rook and play queen e6. So he did take me, but in roared this. But I had one more trick up his sleeve, which was this. One more trick up his sleeve, which is a move that I did not even consider because I thought I would have a checkmate with something. I thought I would be able to mate him somehow. Uh, the point is, no matter where he went, he was, he was busted. He went to f8, I would take... And then I would just take on f6, frankly. I would just play here, that's mate, so he takes. and uh, I can win the end game like this, you know? Like, this is also a completely winning position. But instead of that, after king g6, just rook g3. And the point is, if he hides, well, then I would have had a chance to sacrifice the rook! Queen e7, queen f6. But instead of all of that, he sacrificed his queen and took. But it was not the bishop that I was after. It was this. And the point of king g6 is that if this, that's a problem. And now I am x-rayed. Skewered. Not x-rayed. Skewered. Uh, and uh, he played king g6. I gave him a check. 
And when the dust settled, I grabbed his rook, I grabbed his pawn because my queen was hanging, and in this position, he ran out of time, but he only had like one second on the clock, so he basically resigned, and uh, I defeated him with an accuracy of like 95%. I mean, that was a very, very, very controlled game. I played that game from start to finish with solidity, with poise, I, with patience. At times, I fell very slightly into bad habits, such as bishop d3, just like trying to trade off his bishop for some reason. But overall, if I can play like this, I, 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 can, I can beat these grandmasters. I mean, I did not make any blunder. I thought I played very well. My accuracy was 94%. Of course, I had some mistakes, some inaccuracies, like in the opening. This gives me... what? A, shut up. But I had this brilliancy, which I was very happy with. Uh, knight takes f7 is likely, yeah, the brilliant move. Um, of course, I planned that from the beginning. And my estimated elo in this game was 3,300. So I played like a 3,300 this game. And I finished the tournament with 8 points out of 11. 3 wins versus Grandmasters. A loss! I also lost a couple games to Grandmasters. I lost one game to a Grandmaster. I lost to uh, Alexander Indic from Serbia. But overall, 8 out of 11. And, uh, you know, uh, events like this and days like this do make me feel like, uh, like I'm not a total bozo. I'm not a total bum. I know how to play chess. And uh, we keep getting better and better. We keep beating Grandmasters. And it's quite nice. It is quite a nice feeling. So... Let this, be as an let this be an inspiration to those of you who might be in a slump at the moment. Uh, sometimes it feels like all of my chess is a slump. Uh, but I wanted to share it with you. I hope you enjoyed the games. Hopefully they were kind of instructive, kind of interesting. Uh, if you're in London, events are in the description. If you are going to be in Canada, more information coming on events. So if you click on the link and there's no URL there, yet, check back. It will be there. Uh, I'll see some of you soon. And I will see you all tomorrow for more Gotham content. Get out of here.